Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the rootless or sit in the seat of the scoffers. In this law, they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. Their leaves do not wither. Please join me as together we confess our sins to God. Gracious God, we acknowledge today that we do not always keep our roots in you. We unconsciously drift and allow our roots to be immersed in things that do not give life. Consumerism, people pleasing, addiction to control and ego, and lore of consciously going through the motions. Shake us up today. Transplant us that our roots might reestablish themselves in your love and your amazing aliveness. May the healing sap of life inch up through us that we might be ablaze with new life. Amen. All who said nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, and that includes us ourselves. God's love is stronger than our rootlessness and will always seek us out and meet us exactly where we are. Praise God. Please be seated. Together with Psalm 2, Psalm 1 serves as an introduction to the entire book. It exalts God's instructions for life and celebrates the blessings of living by them. 
Listen as the psalmist extols the ways of righteousness and compares them to verdant trees. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the rootless, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. God is still speaking. Today we also hear some of the closing words from the cryptic book of Revelation. Whether you hear this book literally or metaphorically, today's words are among the most comforting in all scripture, as the writer shares a beautiful vision of the close of history. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be God's peoples and God will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is a tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. God is still speaking. I'll be focusing this morning on the archetype of the tree of life, but before we get to that, I'd like to talk a bit about trees in general which I believe are powerfully spiritual. The late poet Mary Oliver, for example, says this in her poem entitled, When I Am Among the Trees. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, although equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness, I would almost say that they save me and daily, for I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light, and to shine. Indeed, to go easy, not to have it easy, mind you, but to go easy, to flow with life rather than resist it. The trees accept each season as it comes and bow with the wind allowing it to prune them of dead weight so that new growth can emerge. Trees, indeed, have a great deal to teach us. In Emerson Point Preserve in Palmetto, Florida, where my husband and I lived for 10 years, there are two trees that we got to know especially well. Both are very near the fresh waters of the Manatee River just before it meets the salty gulf. They are both large and striking trees and each fed us spiritually by their presence. The first is a Moreton fig with multiple roots that emerge up from the ground to create waist high ridges. Clearly it is very old, 
even its secondary trunks being a foot or more in diameter. It climbs to the sky with praise to God, sheltering all the smaller trees around it. And it is so majestic that the first time I saw it, I gasped. The storms of the last few years have vastly dim diminished it. The huge major right branch was lost, but what was spared by hurricanes Irma, Ian, and most recently Adalia is now regrowing. Because this tree is planted by the water, it is held on and is starting to regrow in spite of the storms that life has put it through. The writer of Psalm 1, which we heard this morning, reminds us that we must allow ourselves to be planted by fresh water, to be nourished spiritually, to let the water of God's love come up through our deepest roots. The psalmist finds this in meditating on scripture. Some find silent meditation to be helpful. Others find singing or listening to uplifting music keeps them focused and strong in faith. Prayer is the key for some, whether traditional prayers or spontaneous expressions. For others, ecstatic experiences, like dancing for the Sufi followers of Islam or Pentecostal Christians. The first lesson trees teach us is that in order for us to survive the storms and the regular ups and downs of life, we must allow God to feed our spirits. We must find the ways God can strengthen and uphold us, the ways we can grow so we will not be moved from a solid foundation when the ravages of illness or tragedy or financial reversal come to us. What is it that feeds your spirit? What is it that grounds you and helps you keep perspective? I confess to you that I have sometimes been better at regularly doing those things than at others, but in my last few years, I've made my prayer time a priority and practice it more or less daily. And it really does make a huge difference in both my quality of life and in my ability to set myself aside and to serve others. The second tree in the Palmetto Preserve is a huge oak that sits atop the temple mound of those ancient indigenous ruins. It is large and magnanimous in that you can see huge plants are climbing up its trunk and tiny ferns growing in its branches. The tree is large enough to share the water and sunshine it needs with other species growing right from it. It is a beautiful example of literally welcoming and sheltering others of God's creatures in its enormous limbs. The tree teaches us about generosity, that in God's economy of abundance, there is always enough so it gladly shares the resources it needs with all the other plants around it. It too lost a major limb, but it also continues to grow back while giving space to its plant companions. The great sequoia trees of the West Coast also have much to teach, specifically about living in community. Did you know that their roots are very shallow? They can root in just three feet of earth, but at the most, they root 12 to 14 feet deep, which is nothing in comparison to their tremendous height. How can a tree that was already a thousand years old when Jesus walked the earth, and that is nearly 300 feet tall and weighs two million pounds be held up by such shallow roots? The answer is that those roots spread out quickly and widely. And not only that, they intertwine their roots with the roots of their neighboring trees. These giants of the forest literally hold each other up from their roots. 
What a marvelous image of mutual interdependence. What a perfect metaphor for the church. Imagine if the human community could follow their example. The remarkably resilient sequoias also teach us about keeping going through difficult times. The trees will survive fires as evidenced by scars on their trunks and will also survive windstorms and rain. But when the sequoia is finally overcome by some calamity, it then gives us a tutorial in its own succession planning and ensures the future of the community. <coughs> the National Forest Service reports that whenever fire, wind, or other destructive agents manage to eliminate an older tree and expose the mineral soil, large numbers of seedlings appear quickly and develop into a dense stand of vigorous successor trees. Even in death, the sequoia is able to nourish future generations. Indeed, trees are amazing. Scientists tell us that in this life, forests are good for you. There is even a new name for spending time in the woods called forest bathing, which involves hours long immersion in forests to drink up their oxygen and immerse oneself in their palpable healing energy. There is evidence that surgical patients recover faster if they have woodland views. Trees reduce ground level ozone and other airborne pollutants that worsen asthma. A few years ago, our son ran the seven miles from our home in Florida to the hiking paths of the forest preserve I mentioned earlier and he reported he could literally feel the percentage of cool, clean oxygen shoot up as he entered the dense wooded area. Study shows that trees in urban areas improve cognitive function and promote an active lifestyle. Children who have green spaces in which to play show improved performance in school. Trees are also the source of many medicines more than 120 distinct chemicals derived from them are used in a variety of human medications. The National Cancer Institute says that more than two thirds of all cancer fighting drugs come from rainforest growth. More discoveries are made each year. Just recently, scientists found a compound in the needles of the eastern red cedar that fights MRSA an infection that kills thousands every year. And get this, even more recently, science has learned that trees actually communicate with one another. If one tree is attacked by a predatory pest, it sends out hormonal discharges that inform the nearby trees about the attack so that they can create a line of defense. Trees, it would seem, in their own way, talk to one another. Just how cool is that? Trees are then, as a broad entity, powerfully spiritual and enrich our lives dramatically. We could say they are full of the divine spirit, made in the image of God just like we are. So what is their prototype? For this, I think we can turn to the idea of the tree of life, which I would propose as a literal metaphor for God. The tree of life is fund a fundamental and almost universal archetype in the world's mythological, religious, and philosophical traditions. The concept may have originated in Central Asia and was absorbed by other cultures and is especially prevalent in nature and indigenous religions such as paganism and my personal favorite, Celtic spirituality, where we see the tree of life's branches mirror and balance its roots. The branches reach both up and down, eventually touching the roots and creating a full circle, indicating harmony and rebirth. So its history is ancient, 
but by the time it gets to Judeo-Christianity, the tree of life is also still prevalent. And so in our Bible, we see the stately presence of it, both at the beginning of our biblical story, in the early chapters of Genesis, and at the end, the very last book of Revelation from which we read today. <clears throat> Christian history, it would seem, plays out between two gardens, two trees. In Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life stands right next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from which Adam and Eve ate and by which humanity fell from their imagio dei state of perfect wholeness and joy into a state of sin, which is to say distortion of our wholeness. The condition of brokenness, pain, and chronic struggle. In those early chapters of Genesis, after the fall, God places a barrier in front of the tree of life, source of immortality, so that humanity cannot enter a state of immortality while in the state of sin, thus being banished to an eternity of struggle. The tree of life then goes on hiatus or is placed on a shelf for all of human history while the story of God's redemption plays out biblically. It is mentioned a few times in the rest of the Bible, mostly in the moralisms of the book of Proverbs, but it makes its real re-entry at the end when God finally completes the work. It is thus that we came to today's passage. After the comforting words of chapter 21, where we are told that on that great final day, when heaven will descend to earth and earth will be redeemed and become heaven, how do you like that? The Bible indicates that heaven is not going to be on some cloud out there. It's going to be everything we know and love of earth here and now, only healed and whole. So the new Jerusalem will descend to earth and God will wipe away every tear and sorrow and sighing shall be no more and there will be no more death or struggle or addiction or disease or oppression, or sexism, or racism. It'll be like that incredible poem that went viral on Facebook recently after the death of Pat Robertson by the poet known only as Kay, who described heaven this way. I don't like to think about Pat Robertson going to hell. That lets him off too easily. I like to think about Pat Robertson finding himself in a heaven he never believed would exist, where divine is reading in drag to the children murdered at Sandy Hook and Uvalde, while Edie Windsor and Gertrude Stein drink coffee in the breakfast nook, talking politics with Harvey Milk, where Matthew Shepard relaxes by a stream reading poetry to a nameless young man whose family never claimed his body when he died of AIDS, where the music plays loudly, welcoming dancers from the pulse and club cue to the floor where they twirl in vogue with all the murdered trans women of color whose names we never knew, and where Jesus puts his arm around Pat Robertson's shoulder and drapes them with a rainbow feather boa and gestures around him lovingly and says, come, meet my disciples. That's heaven on earth, where love finally heals everybody, even those we think of as beyond redemption, even you, even me, and the tree of life will be in the center of it all, generously offering its medicinal leaves for the healing of nations. And all shall finally really be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Amen.
When God dreams, it's in the greens of tree leaves and pasture grass, beside calming waters of eternal life. When God dreams, it's dripping with the juice of fruit freshly picked, available all the time, anytime, for anyone who seeks. When God dreams, a river flows through cities always alight with love, with rough brown arms bearing abundance on either side. When God dreams, leaves can heal nations while empires crumble, and God's safety is bountiful and real for all. When God dreams, the promised land is at hand, and heaven is brought to earth, and all is renewed. Come. Lie down where shadows of the boughs will dapple your face, where you can look up through leaf-filtered vision. To the roots in the sky, tracing a network of expanded awareness of your belonging in God's dreams. As above, so below. Stretch and let your soul seep into the ground and tangle itself in the buried heart of the tree of life, of wisdom, of healing, of hope fulfilled, of good done, and unify yourself with the dreams of God, where all belong. And we continue in the spirit of prayer. Lord, we do in indeed thank you for the gifts of your beautiful earth today, and especially the trees. And we offer into your tender care all of the prayers that were named earlier, even as we pray together, as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Again, we remember that to whom much is given from that one, much is asked. Freely we have received, freely give. God, receive our offerings now and use them to your glory and the healing of the world. May they become like leaves from the tree of life, whose fruit is for the healing of nations. Amen.
go now to become a living leaf from the tree of life, that your life and your very being might help to heal the nations. Amen.